Thank you. Good afternoon. I now call to order the February meeting of the Policy Review Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. Baltimore County Public Schools and offices continue to be closed to the public and non-essential personnel in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair, in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent, may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present, and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's public policy as a result, today's policy review committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on the BCPS website. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Clark or Ms. Howie if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Clark, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Yes, Ms. Causey. Present. Mr. Opperman. Present. Mr. Mahumza. Present. And Ms. Scott. Present. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Clark, please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Yes, Dr. Scriven. Present. Dr. McComas. Present. Ms. Burnup. Present. Ms. Langeman. Present. Ms. Shea. Present. Did I miss any staff members? George Saris is here. Thank you, George. Thank That's you. It. That's it. All right. <laughs> the live video footage of the November 16, 2020 meeting represents the minutes of the meeting. The minutes stand approved as recorded. Next, we'll move to unfinished business. As background, the Policy Review Committee approved Policy 6002 for first reader at its meeting on November 16, 2020. On January 5, 2021, during the second reading of the policy, the full board returned policy 6002 to the committee to determine whether additional edits of the policy are recommended as a result of the Office of Legislative Audit's findings. We welcome Mr. Saris to the meeting to discuss the OLA findings as they relate to this policy. Mr. Sarris, will you please state your name for the record and then proceed? Uh, yes, this is George Sarris, Executive Director of Fiscal Services. The um, finding two of the 2020 Legislative Audit Report uh, referenced the uh, acquisition of instructional supplies and materials, um, which is uh, governed by policy and rule 6002. These, uh, as well as a uh, section of the state code 7 106, which uh, adopts a best value standard for in curriculum and instructional materials such that the the low bid is is not uh, applicable but instead that a combination of uh, what meets our needs at the best available price is the standard 
applied here. And with respect to the legislative audit, the essential elements of their finding uh, was that uh, the Department of Curriculum or the Division of Curriculum and Instruction uh, needed to make sure that it documented all of the the meetings and the evaluations that do take place in the course of evaluating and recommending curriculum, uh, a recommendation which is made by the chief academic officer to the superintendent as a result of that, what we call the 6002 process. And by the at the conclusion of the audit, as of September 30, 2020, uh, the Division of Curriculum Instruction had implemented uh, an internal documentation process that uh, met the uh, criteria identified by the Office of Legislative Audit, and we've been operating under that uh, process ever since. So, uh, members of the committee, uh, Dr. Boswell McComas, Ms. Shea are here if you have specific questions about the procedure that is used by the Division of Curriculum and Instruction. If I may as well, um, um, just before we get into the questions, I'd just like to say that uh, Ms. Shea and I instituted um, some, some processes to strengthen um, our documentation um, and we really those have been in effect for about three years now um, and Ms. Shea, certainly correct me if I'm wrong. I think our very first year in these roles is really when we um, set out to to design that uh, notebook system to make sure everything was um, was solid and in a uh, system access point. Thank you Thanks. for that. Go ahead. Yes. Um, and I just wanted to open it up to see if there was any discussion and um, from from board members if they had any questions. So um, I can call each board member by name for this purpose. I can just since it's a small amount of us um, to ask any questions of, of staff. So uh, Ms. Calsey, do you have any questions? Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Thank you for um, giving me an opportunity to speak to this policy. Um, since Dr. McComas and um, Ms. Shea are both here, if they could uh, walk us through uh, the curriculum committee and how the presentation of um, new or revised instructional materials is presented and um, how, how that is processed in curriculum committee. Right, thank you, Ms. Kazi. That's a that's a great question because I think the intersection of the curriculum committee work and the 6002 process um, is an important one to understand. And I'll just um, in a moment I'll just have Ms. Shea walk us through um, how we document 6002, and along that journey we'll talk about where it inter intersects with curriculum committee. I would like to just share for the good of. Um, everyone present to understand that there are things that we take to curriculum committee that do not necessarily pertain to the 6002 process. Um, and likewise, there is things that we do that uh, the 6002 process does not per pertain to as well. Um, and so I hope I didn't confuse people, but I think as Ms. Shea kind of walks us through what that process is and how we document, uh, we'll talk about examples along the way that I hope will help continue to support everyone's understanding. So Ms. Shea, if you will we'll go ahead and um, walk us through, and I don't know that we could share the screen. I'm not sure if Ms. Shea oh, yeah, could share I just reached example. out to Mr. Corrins. Yeah, I just reached out. Hi, good afternoon. This is Ms. Shea. Thank you, Dr. McComas. I just reached out to Mr. Corrins to see if I'm allowed to take over the sharing, if that's going to work. Megan, you can way. share at any time. Thank you, sir. OK. So then I will. Here we go. Um, so what I am sharing here is an example of the OneNote process that we use for documentation. Um, I'll make it larger on my screen so that those of you viewing can see it. 
Um, what we've done here down the left hand side, you can see each step of the um, policy and rule 6002 as it is outlined in the policy and rule language, specifically in the rule language. Um, we took each step of that and turned it into a specific tab. And so um, as the process unfolds, um, we also when we um, seek first to purchase a new curricular or instructional material and are seeking to procure it as outlined in 6002. This is the first step. So we create this notebook and then this notebook is shared with the purchasing agent. Um, so that is another area of strength. So as Mr. Saris described, um, this is a process that we do hand in hand with representatives from the Office of Purchasing. And so in creating this template down the left hand side, we have a tab for each step. So the first is a tab just outlining the process um, as it is outlined in policy and rule. Um, the next step is actually forming that stakeholder committee and the language in the rule 6002 does identify specifically the membership that needs to be included. Um, and as you can see here, um, on the tabs, once the evaluation committee is selected, then the actual documentation of their rubric and their scores is also uploaded to this SharePoint site. And that way the Office of Purchasing has any recommendations or data they need for informing any potential vendor that was not selected if they're looking for feedback as part of the purchasing or procurement process. But then it also serves as part of our recommendation that ultimately is crafted and sent to the Chief Academic Officer and then ultimately the curriculum committee presentation. So um, as Ms. Causey was asking, um, the curriculum committee is a step on the process. So after the stakeholder committee has selected a process, I mean, it's selected a curriculum material for recommendation, uh, we have to take it through, um, we have to put it on public display, and then we also take it to the curriculum committee um, for approval at that time before then also moving forward to the contracts committee. So this is where uh, we also would include the board exhibit that's prepared with our partners in the Office of Purchasing, um, as well as what we reference as the four by four or our contract fact sheet. Um, what also happens as part of our 6002 process along the steps is that for any, um, as you know, and we talked a lot about this in our uh, last committee meeting around uh, blended use of print and digital materials, um, even our print textbooks that we purchase often come with a digital component. So it's also important that as part of our 6002 review, we also have to partner with the Department of Information Technology and ensure that we are following the guidelines for uh, student data privacy um, and integration into BCPS1. And then if there is a field test, and I say if because it depends on the nature of the materials being procured, then that information would be shared here as well. Um, so this is the, when we talk about the findings being around documentation of that process, this is the um, structure that's been implemented. Um, and you were right with your timeline, Dr. McComas. We started the training with our team in establishing this procedure and partnering with the Office of Purchasing. Um, and I would say that any new curriculum materials procured through 6002 since the 1819 school year have been documented in this way. And so I'll pause there if there's any questions um, for well, the committee. Let me let me just also add before we get to questions. Um, what I ask that the committee understand is that according to our rule, the tra traditionally all of this is documented and each individual office uh, was responsible for holding on to that documentation. Um, by shifting this to a centralized notebook process that we have joint uh, ability to share with purchasing, that really opens up um, um, sort of the um, access, if you will, to being consistent in a way that now it's not depending upon individual office and individual files and what if somebody leaves or um, things of that nature, that sort of uh, ability to hand uh, pass information down um, institutionally. This format really has allowed us to work seamlessly with the purchasing office in a way that uh, prior to using this technology, it was it was not as um, quite as seamless um, as it is now. So I just want to point out that um, by creating this system, it's really um, we have found much more beneficial and I think efficient, quite frankly, for everyone um, and clear as to the documentation and where it is and how to access it, regardless of which office is working on it.
Thank you for that. Um, any additional questions, Ms. Causey? Yes, thank you for that. Um, I guess what I was looking for in the policy and or in the processing during the curriculum committee is where is the language around the value oriented, which was uh, par part of the issue Mr. Saris was discussing related oh, to- Oh, I see. I, yes, I see your question. Thank you, Ms. Kazi. So um, in the curriculum committee, so first I'd like to make sure that everybody understands that curriculum committee is not contract committee, right? So the purpose of curriculum committee is to ensure that whatever material or resource or professional service that we're bringing forward um, is that it meets an, uh, an educational need um, within our school system for our students and that um, it, it not only meets the need that we have, but that it meets the standards of content. It meets the standards of, um, you know, uh, for example, one of the things that has happened nowadays in the last couple of years has, is, is an expectation around highly rated resources, right? So they're the type of standards that the curriculum committee's job is to look at. And so when we present to the curriculum committee, we're really doing our presentation around that. What is this resource? Why is, do we need it for our students? And how does it in fact fit those educational requirements or needs? And so when we talk about Mr. Saris's comment around best value, that uh, discerning of best value is really part of the uh, work of the evaluation committee. So Ms. Shea, I'm not sure if you can commandeer the screen again uh, to go back to where that is in the process. And so Ms. Causey, that's really um, part of the work early on um, in terms of, and again, Ms. Shea, correct me where I misspeak. Um, so the curriculum committee job is not to look at the pricing of this resource. The curriculum committee's job is to look at the, the um, need and purpose and does it meet the standard. You know, as you know, Ms. Causey, our contracts committee is really where we get into, are we getting the optimal um, pricing uh, for a resource rather that is through a competitively bid process or through the 6002 process where it is the best value for the quality of content um, and the type of, of material that we we are seeking to meet a need up for our students. So I'm, I hope that that helped explain, but you can see in Ms. Shea, if maybe you talk a little bit more around mm -hmm. um, how as you work through this process on, you know, any particular material uh, where that best value um, right. comes in. Thank you. And, and so to add to that conversation, the distinction about materials selected through 6002 as opposed to a competitive bid, we actually don't include uh, price of the materials in the initial evaluation. The initial oh, evaluation from the stakeholder committee is based solely on the elements listed in 6002 in the rule, which speaks to alignment to standards, free from bias, representation of the um, student population we serve, and some of those other criteria. Um, once we get to the point of having the evaluation committee using that rubric that's generated based on, I should also mention um, that we now begin every process within 6002 with an RFI or request for information. That was not always the case and is not actually outlined in policy and rule, but was best practice. And so since adopting these um, more clear and consistent guidelines for documentation, we do initiate a request for information um, as a first step. And then the materials that are selected for the evaluation community to review, the rubric that is used from each office reflects the nature of that request for information. So once we identify and aligns with rule 6002 in terms of the criteria, it is only after that initial evaluation um, committee and those um, scores are generated by the stakeholder committee that the price, um, when we talk about value being the actual price per student, comes into play. So it isn't actually a part of the 6002 review process until the very end prior to it going to the curriculum committee um, presentation. And that's the moment, as Dr. McComas shared, where typically we use the language about um, price per student um, in terms of that. Um, because again, as Dr. McComas said, the um, academic stakeholders and content offices do not work through the um, negotiation or any of that pricing uh, information. That's all handled by our partners in the Office of Purchasing. Thank you Thank so you, much. And I'm sorry yeah. I misspoke in the early process 
I want to make sure we get to all board members because I know there's probably quite a few questions. Um, uh, Mr. Mahomza, do you have a question? Yes. Um, can you clarify, uh, is this notebook accessible to the public or is it just the staff members? No, this is an internal process that e that we have in the Department of Academics and actually across the whole division for maintaining the documentation of the process. OK, um, yeah, and I, I'm, I, I've always I've been asking this question of pretty much anybody even my fellow peers and teachers about like uh, storing uh, important documents like this and seeing how comprehensive the notebook is. I'm just wondering um, what um, like I, I don't know if they were, notebooks were affected during the ransomware attack, but I'm just curious. Uh, have, have are you stored it in any other format or um, taking other steps to ensure that uh, that information is not lost in case um, it's needed? Yes, sir. So you um, you bring up something very important, and certainly I think all of us have learned the importance of backing up data files and having them in multiple places. Um, both because of this finding and, and, and finding the documentation with individual offices, which is part of why we share this in multiple places, but also um, after having been the victim of the catastrophic ransomware attack, I think all of us have learned very important lessons. So we do have um, systems for um, backing up data um, and being sure to, to save these very important documentations on external hard, dri hard drives and some of those other processes that just have been um, good practice that now become best practice. Um, and then the other thing that I will offer is we are also, um, we had started working with um, partners in the Department of Information Technology about the use of a SharePoint site um, and had started to transition our uh, OneDrive resources into a SharePoint site. The reason for that transition is because OneDrives are connected, as you mentioned, Mr. Mahamza, to individual users. You have your own personal OneDrive, even if it's through the organization. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that with staff turnover or um, retirements or promotions, we want to make sure that the SharePoint goes beyond that. Um, we had started that work in the fall. I have a, there's a phenomenal a uh, member of Mr. Korn's team. Um, and then, of course, uh, their efforts are rightly so prioritized with other things since then. So that is sort of work next is to take these um, items that are shared in OneDrive and move them to a SharePoint site uh, to have that shared ownership and make sure that we have that longevity of that documentation moving forward. OK, hey, thank you. Those, those are all my questions. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you, Mr. Mahomes. Uh, Mr. Offerman, any questions? I think everything I was concerned about was uh, was already answered. Thank you. OK, great. All right. Um, and I didn't know if there were any other board members who had joined us um, who had any questions. OK, I had well, I had a question, but Miss Shay just um, and, and Dr. McCall. My doc, blah, blah. Dr. Hi. McComas <laughs> um, both just answered them. Um, it was to Ms. Causey's second question, but thank you. There is um, one more thing I'd just like to add, um, and perhaps we've mentioned it, but I think along with Ms. Shea and I collaborating with our partners in the purchasing office and really coming to what would be the sort of a best practice way of ensuring uh, proper and clear and thorough documentation, we have also been um, providing professional development for people within the division to make sure that as new people have come on or um, that all, like we sort of set out to level set to make sure that um, everyone had the same understanding of 6002, how we document it and how to work in partnership with our purchasing colleagues. So. OK, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. All right, um, so um, if there are no corrections to policy 6002, then it's moved forward for second reading as previously approved um, by the committee. Oh, Ms. Caldy, did you have a follow up question? Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. So in the Office of Legislative Audit November of 2020 report on page 18, mm -hmm. um, recommendation number one, states that we recommend that BCPS comply with its established policies and state law when procuring goods and services. Um, 
but that is not mentioned in the policy 6002 um, related to complying with state with state law and um, I thought it might be helpful to do that um, but the other question I had is it, um, in listening to some of the curriculum committee meetings <clears throat> not as a member but as a board member attending for information purposes it seems that an a uh, tremendous amount of um, great work does get done by the uh, Office of Curriculum in terms of evaluating, but then it seems that maybe uh, a lot of the work is done without realizing if there are options that are um, as effective, but that have a better value. So that's where I'm still not um, seeing where how the process evaluates the value before um, the curriculum um, instructional process gets too far down the road. So, Ms. Clausey, may I ask just a few um, uh, questions myself so that I can fully understand how to move forward and help ensure that we're addressing that? So, it sounds like your your understanding is that by the time we bring it to curriculum committee, we haven't looked at other resources that you think is that what I am understanding your concern around. So for instance, when we have buildings and contracts committee and there's a, a contract being brought forward for different vendors, uh, different services or materials, um, sometimes there are the category or the a table included that shows the distinction between one uh, bidder's costing methodology you know, final bid price and so forth, what's included, what might not be included versus the other bids that were received. So okay. that's where uh, the Office of Purchasing and the Office of Facilities, if it's related to uh, facilities, can evaluate best value, mm -hmm. what is uh, going to be effective, but also, um, you know, the best value. Uh, the best use of of the money so in terms of curriculum and structure excuse me instructional material contracts coming forward that has never seemed to be the case and, and so that's a question okay okay thank you so i appreciate you kind of expanding for me to make sure that i understand fully um because i think you know part of the 6002 process is that um sort of sorting out what are the resources or the products out there in the market that meet the need um and so i think part of what um we could do is perhaps share um in in future committees like you know, we looked at five different products. Uh, typically what happens is we just bring forward the ones that make it through the process. We don't bring forward the ones that were weeded out along the way, if you will. Okay. And Ms. Causey, just so you're aware, in section uh, four sub B of the rule, selection of appropriate instructional materials shall adhere to applicable federal and state laws, as well in, board, in the board policy, subsection 2a is an apple uh, there is reference there as well to adhering to federal and state law thank you it looks like um miss pastor you had a question Ms. i do that, yes thank you um i i just wanted to address um miss causey's question from the perspective of a committee member and the chair um, one of the beauties of having had um, educators on there and even with our student members uh, and other members and Miss um, Mack, we certainly delve, if, as you said, Miss Causey, you've watched the meeting, so you know that it's not um, a talking head kind of meeting, that um, we certainly do go into um, a, a lot of questioning of Ms. Shea, Dr. McComas, and anyone else who is a guest uh, about the um, programs that they share with us, asking the questions about use, asking questions about um, 
a spillover, if you will, if they come, for example, with something that is for special education um, and they explain it, can it also be used in other ways? Um, certainly we've had questions from Ms. Mack where she's asked questions about two different programs uh, where she thinks there's overlap. And uh, both Dr. McComas and Ms. Shea have also, and that happened recently, to point out that it might look like an overlap in one regard, but there was a component to it, a tutorial component, if you will, that uh, came out of um, that we didn't pay for, that was just for that particular component. So by the time they get to us, to the curriculum, they are not just laying out things. They have already done the homework. Um, Dr. McComas has a litany of questions and points that she uses as the barometer before they bring it to us. So we don't even, as members, just accept what they bring. We know um, and they include as part of the discussion. Um, and again, you said you've been there, so you've heard that um, so that we know that they have done their homework, if you will, before they get to us. And we too have done our homework as we are asking questions. Okay. Thank you for that, Ms. Pastor. And we are already, looks like 20 minutes behind. So I want to make sure everybody has a chance to ask questions, speak on things, have thorough debate. Um, so what I would like to know now, if there are any corrections to policy 6002, and if there are no corrections, then um, policy 6002 is moved forward for second reading um, as previously approved in the minutes. So with that now, we would move on to policy 8311. And for that, we have Ms. Howie, and if you could, Ms. Howie, please state your full name for the minutes and then um, continue. Surely. Margaret Ann Francis Howie, General Counsel, here to present to you again, uh, members of the committee, Board Policy 8311. Uh, this has been before the committee on a few occasions, specifically uh, the request of the committee and prior discussion had to do with making sure that there was some sort of mechanism in your policy for making sure that individuals who wanted to participate in hybrid board meetings were able to do so, so that everyone knew what standards and what rules applied. Uh, that there have been no significant changes, but there were several questions uh, that um, occurred in the interregnum. So for example, on in the special rules for electronic meetings, there is a question about uh, making sure that individuals provide uh, their um, proposed motions. That is on page three. There is also a forced disruption um, that there were questions about. That is on page five. And the chat feature that has been used at most recent board meetings, uh, although it's not referred to as the chat feature, is referenced on page four, um, subsection 10 about assignment of the floor and making motions and providing those motions to the full assembly. If there are specific questions that the committee has or further suggestions that the committee wanted to um, wanted to review uh, that it, this is certainly the time to do this obviously uh, as well uh, given the fact that the board is considering and has discussed going back to some sort of in-person meeting or hybrid meeting uh, you would want the full board to know what the expectations are so i'm available to answer questions Thank you for that, Ms. Howie. And again, um, I'll call members uh, by name. Um, if there's any discussion, um, I will call your name and we can proceed. We'll start again first with Ms. Causey. Do you have any discussion or any questions, Ms. Causey? Um, not at this time. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Mr. Mahomza. I have no comments right now. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Offerman. Yes, uh, at our last uh, 
at our last curriculum committee meeting, uh, there was mostly mostly was not in the chat. There was an interest in trying to in trying to keep that committee meeting uh, meeting uh, not meeting meeting not not in person mm -hmm. uh, as a group uh, for, for at least the rest of this year. I assume mm -hmm. that way uh, is is that how does that interact with this uh, with this with this policy? So this policy would not prohibit uh, committees or even the board from having fully um, electronic meetings. And uh, the other part of that is we need to have that decision made by the whole board and does it affect all the committees? You know, or 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 it can be done committee by uh, by a committee. It can be done committee by committee. Thank you. And uh, Madam Chairperson, I forgot to ask if staff who were here for policy 6002 could be excused. I'm sure oh, yeah. they're hanging on uh, every word about the board, other board policies, but I'm also sure that they have other things that they could be doing. Yes. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Have a good day. Okay. Okay, were there any additional questions? Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Um, if there are no corrections, then policy 8311 is moved forward for first reading as presented. Okay, next on the agenda is policy 8314. As background, the policy review committee approved policy 8314 for first reader at its meeting on October 19, 2020. On December 8, 2020, during the second reading of the policy, the full board returned policy 8314 to the committee for further consideration. The policy draft before you tonight includes recommended revisions received from board members. So Ms. Howie, if you could please continue. It was recommended uh, from board members that uh, agenda items uh, be uh, presented. Excuse me, let me get the language in front of me. That the agenda items uh, be presented, and I'm sorry, I have the wrong copy. If you'll please excuse me, uh, members of the Ms. Howard, you're muted. I guess she asked for us to give her a moment there. Yes, just a moment, Madam Chair. Thank you. My apologies, uh, members of the committee. So it was requested uh, by uh, board members uh, of subsection 3A concerning changes to the agenda that uh, once agendas are published, that they cannot be changed uh, except by unanimous consent of the full board at the board meeting. Uh, and that uh, board members who wish to make motions uh, must submit those motions at least 
24 hours in advance of uh, a particular board meeting. And uh, as I said, that agendas could only be changed by unanimous consent. Those were the requests that were made and are incorporated into the draft that you have. Thank you. So again, I'll go around if there's any questions or um, if there's any discussion. Uh, first, I will call on Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Ms. Howie, for um, that explanation. Uh, so as a board member that started in July of 2015, when policy 8314 at the time had uh, the clause and agenda item uh, could be added, removed, or corrected if the board consents by unanimous vote um, to amend the agenda was very onerous, and it meant that just one person could um, prevent the work of uh, the board from being moved forward with agenda items not even being able to be discussed. So whereas the um, by state law, board action is taken with seven votes. It's a quorum of the members, um, <clears throat> which when there's 12 members is seven. Um, and then when there's 11 members, when which is the case when the student member uh, is not able to vote by law, uh, then the quorum is six. So I would not support that clause at all and think that it should revert back to uh, what it was when this board um, started in January of 2019 uh, to make it the majority of the board. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Mr. Mahomza? No comment. Okay. Uh, Mr. Offerman? I don't have any comment at this time. Okay, great. Um, and I would comment on that. I would say that um, I think that it's something that would be helpful to streamline our meetings to help them to be more efficient. Um, we um, spent a considerable amount of time at the beginnings of each meeting um, discussing uh, added agenda items and um, that I believe causes our meetings to go considerably over and I don't feel it's fair to our public, to our stakeholders, and I think that this would be something good that could streamline our meetings so that we could be more efficient and um, uh, uh, work more smoothly. So um, I'd like to know, so are there any corrections to the policy? Okay. Madam Chair, this yes. is Ms. Causey, if I may. Yes, do you have a motion or a correction to the policy? Yes, I would make a motion to return. Uh, let's see, <clears throat> on page two. Could you put item, your motion in the chat? Yes, I will. On page two, line 30, um, I'm actually going to ask Ms. Howie, because I don't have that document here, to. Um, make a motion to revert it back to the version that was approved in January of 2019. Okay. So could you state what that motion is? So I'm not sure. Well, that I would I would like Miss Howie or or Miss Clark to uh, read what was there prior. It, it doesn't show it here. Typically, there's the old language in brackets that's being deleted. Yes, ma'am. The old language is in brackets, uh, and the and it's the superintendent may ask that an agenda item be removed. The board takes no exception and consents by unanimous vote. The agenda item will be removed. And then um, subsection two, uh, during a board meeting, a board member may move to amend an agenda uh, as follows. Uh, and items may be added, removed, or corrected by a vote of approval by a majority of the whole board. That's the language that's currently in the policy. Thank you for pointing that out. I'm typing in the chat. Sure. Uh, 
Miss Abby, sorry. Um, you said which the old language is in what format? Brackets. Brackets, okay. Sorry, that was uh, Miss Scott. Yes, I, I'm sorry. I know you asked Miss Abby. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> okay. All right, so Miss, oh, you're typing your motion in now? Okay. Yes. So the motion is during the regular board meeting, a board member may move to amend the agenda as follows. Items may be added, removed, or corrected by a vote of approval by a majority of the whole board. Okay, I still don't see it in chat. Um, is there a second? Okay. All right, so hearing no second, um, then um, we'll move on. And our next item is our, um, let's see. Next item is the ethics code policy, ethics code policies. And for that, I call on Ms. Howie. Please continue. Thank you, Madam Chair, but I'm not sure that there's been action taken on 8314. Oh, I apologize. Okay. Oh, okay. So then, yes. Yeah, so then, um, since the motion failed, if there are no corrections, then policy 8314 is moved forward, forwarded to second reading as previously approved by the committee. So, Madam Chair, um, the, as uh, Ms. Cogney is aware, the uh, policy review committee asked that the ethics code policies be placed on the agenda for the policy review committee this year. Uh, we asked the ethics review panel if they had any changes or suggestions to, um, to amend any of the ethics code policy. We did receive suggestions uh, and a clarification actually uh, for policy 8362, which is the gifts policy. But I'm going to go through uh, the policies one by one. So first 8360, which is um, the applicability and definitions policy. Uh, what we've done is included definitions to strengthen, we believe, the policy uh, by using the definitions that are in Comar 19A. Uh, as well, there was an interest specifically by former uh, committee member Ms. Rowe in uh, determining for those members of the board who are elected whether or not there are different standards. Uh, as a result, we have, we're suggesting, suggesting to include uh, a definition of contribution that comes directly from the ethics code. That is found, I'm sorry, from the election article. That is found on page two, starting at line 10 through line 38. On page three, starting at line one, designated second home is in the Comar, um, uh, is in regulations. Comar 19A. Uh, so we are including that definition as we are with home address, which is on page four at line eight. The other changes are um, found on page six, principal home, qualified relative, and second home are all from the regulations uh, for Board of Education Model Ethics Regulations found at Comar 19A. And if you would permit me to proceed with the policies because they really are um, best seen uh, holistically. Uh, policy 8361, there are really no substantive changes here. We just made sure that we referenced the Model Board of Education Ethics Regs and um, put the reference in your legal references section. Policy 8362, as I mentioned, the ethics review panel made suggested edits. And those edits had to do, first of all, with pointing out that in the previous uh, version of the, of the, uh, the policy, we'd included two Roman numeral twos in the policy. We have sort of um, reorganized the way that the policy is presented. So first, what you have are definitions of gift, 
honorarium and school official. Then from there, standards that are reordered from the policy as it stood before. There really isn't a uh, substantive change here. It's just making sure that it's clear to schools and offices, particularly on page four about gifts of money or property to schools or offices. Again, reorganizing what was in the policy previously, but making sure it's clearer to the end user what exactly is required. We've also reordered where use of financial information is. So you'll see that on page three, subsection F as in Frank. Um, that is, that same language is in Comar 19A, but we've included it in the gifts provision here so that it's clear that that's also that also could be considered a violation of ethics obligations, particularly if there's an exchange of some sort. If you uh, I'll now take you to board policy 8363. Uh, the definitions there are the same that are in Coma 19A and unfortunately my dog wants to be heard as well. And regulated lo lobbyists, you can find on page three, that is from the regulation. Prestige of office, again, we've reordered, used definitions from the, from Comar 19A. Policy 8364, which is the financial disclosure statement policy. What you'll see here under subsection 1B is that we have expanded the list and clarified who is supposed to file a financial disclosure statement. We haven't expanded exactly who's supposed to file, simply expanded the way they're described in this particular policy. We think that would make it clearer for individuals so that not only does the individual know that he or she is expected to file, but also that the board policy for the ethics review panel is made clearer so they know how to impose this obligation. Policy 8365, we've also included in this policy, this is your lobbying policy. Uh, we've also included a new form uh, for those individuals who wish to file. Uh, at uh, last, uh, as I recall, we only had three or four this past year or last uh, fiscal year who filed to be lobbyists. Uh, it is not something that happens very often, but obviously it's a policy that uh, we need to make sure we have the, the tools in place for. And finally, policy 8366, which is about your ethics panel itself. The panel did not recommend any changes to the policy about the panel. Uh, we've simply included uh, a few tweaks to make sure that it's clear what the panel's role is and how hearings can be conducted. So with that, I'm available to answer any questions and happy to answer any questions that the committee members have. That was quite thorough. Thank you, Ms. Howie. Um, again, we'll start with Ms. Causey. Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and before we moved too far along, um, and I also appreciate the uh, explanation, but before we moved too far along, uh, I had put in the chat that I had another comment on policy 8314, um, which is um, I don't believe that it's in compliance with the Open Meetings Act. And also, uh, sorry, excuse me, Ms. Cossey, we've moved on from that, so I believe it would be out of order to discuss a policy that we've moved on from. And now that we're in the discussion of a new policy, that seems as if that would be out of um, order of our meeting. So, uh, yeah, so if you have any questions on policy 8360, um, I'm sure Ms. Howie would be more than happy to answer those and, and assist you in any way. Thank you, Madam Chair, for that explanation. It was my understanding that um, our current practice would be to put into the chat uh, and then wait um, for you to see it or an opportunity to speak so as to not interrupt the speaker. Um, that is correct, yes, and I, I appreciate that. Um, as I saw that question or comment came into 
the chat um, after we had already approved the policy and moved on. So um, I, I, that's why I like to make sure I give everybody ample time to ask any questions. And um, and and I know that you, <laughs> you know, are very thorough and have a lot of questions. So um, I'm happy to start with you first um, so that we can make sure that everybody has the opportunity to um, ask their questions. So um, uh, do you have any questions on policy 8360? I do, um, but first I would like to say, Madam Chair, that the committee did not vote to move policy 8314 forward. So that was going to be my comment that we should take a vote on moving it forward. Okay, Ms. Howie, could you please advise, is it necessary to take a vote on moving policy 8314 forward? I know Ms. Causey made a motion um, and there was not a second, so um, I thought it was appropriate since there were no additions or changes to move um, policy 8314 forward. So either way is correct. Uh, if there's not consensus to move it forward, you can certainly open it up to the committee for a vote. Okay, and consensus would be um, a quorum of the board or? It would be most, it would be the, uh, that there's no objection to moving it forward uh, but in order to formalize the action of the committee, it's fine to take a vote. Okay, then. Um, but so we are out of order, but I guess because we're in committee, we can try to be relaxed a little bit. Um, I then um, move that um, we move policy uh, 8314 forward. Is there a second? S second, Offerman. Thank you. Um, could we take a roll call vote, please, of those in favor of moving it forward? Uh, yes, Ms. Causey? No. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Mahunza? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So three in favor. So um, 83, 14 passes and we'll move forward. So now we can process uh, 8360 and um, we'll start with you, Ms. Causey. Um, actually, other board members can go first. Well, I was going around. So is it that you don't have any questions or you would prefer um, other members to go before you? I do have questions, but I would prefer other board members to go first. Thank you. Okay, yeah, no worries. Uh, Mr. Mahomza. I have no comment. Okay, Mr. Offerman. None. All right. Um, and my uh, comments just said it was very thorough. It was a lot of reading, um, and um, I like your explanation that you gave us, Ms. Howie, as far as the um, brackets. <laughs> what has been changed is, and I want to make sure I have that right. The previous language was in the brackets, and then what has changed is outside of the brackets. Okay, great. Just want to. It was a lot of reading, um, but I just wanted to make sure I had a clear understanding of that. So thank you. Surely, and new material is actually all caps. And I'm sorry, I forgot to mention um, to the committee or remind the committee that even when the board passes whatever version of the ethics code it wishes to pass, you still we've still required by state regulation to send the policies to the state ethics commission. So it's possible that the state ethics commission could accept, reject, or modify whatever the board ultimately passes. So if you look at the very last page of any of the policies, you'll see not only the date they were enacted, but the date they were approved by the SEC. Okay, that's a good clarification, thank you. And I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that earlier. Oh, no worries, we have it now. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Ms. Causey, did you have any questions? Ms. Causey? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, I wanted to make a motion to amend policy um, 8364 that speaks to the retention of the ethics financial disclosure statements. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking for that page. Okay, that's on page three, paragraph six, retention requirements. 
I make a motion to replace the number four with the number 10. And could you uh, again, uh, Ms. Causey, put that in chat because that sounded. Um, yes, I am. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to make sure that we. Everybody, there's different types of learners, <laughs> visual and those who hear. So. Um, I appreciate that. OK. And again, Ms. Causey, you said it was on which page? Or I guess I'll see when you put it in chat. That's all right. Page three. OK. So actually, Ms. Causey, do you mean page five? Subsection six. Retention requirements. Oh, thank you. So that is the uh, there's multiple versions and that was the current one. So policy 8364. Draft. Should have PRC draft at the bottom with today's date. And that would be line 10. I'm sorry, page five, line 10. Yes, thank you. I'll revise this in the chat. Yes, thank you. So my motion is policy 8364, page five, line 10, move to replace the number four with 10. Okay, um, so Ms. Uh, Causey's, um, so is there a second? Second. Who seconded that? Mr. Mahamza. Okay, great. And um, Ms. Causey, would you like to move to your motion? Excuse me, would you like to speak to your motion? <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Just briefly, um, with situations that have occurred and um, understanding more about the timeline of um, legislative audits and other audits and also uh, reviewing the document retention schedule for other documents of the board, um, it seemed more consistent to have a longer time frame. Okay. Any other questions? All right, then let's take it to a vote. Um, if we could do a roll call vote um, for those in favor of, and I will restate uh, Ms. Causey's motion is policy 8364, page five, line 10, move to replace the number four with the number 10. And um, I'm sorry, before we take it to a vote, Ms. Causey, what you're asking is that for, um, as I pull that up now, you're asking right now, it says the panel or the office designated by the board shall retain financial disclosure statements for four years from the date of receipt. And you're asking that it, instead of um, our financial disclosures or any uh, the, anyone who files financial disclosures, instead of it being four years, you're wanting it to stay for 10 years. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, great. All right. Um, yeah, so um, any additional questions from, from any members? No, hearing none. OK, let's take it to a vote, please. If we could do a roll call vote. OK, Ms. Causey. Yes. Mr. Offerman. Abstain. Mr. Mahunza. Yes. Ms. Scott. No. OK, so there is one abstention, one no. And two yeses. Doesn't Correct. pass. I'm sorry. I, I don't think it passes, right? Okay. No, I, that's what I want to know. So, does the motion pass, or um, what happens to the motion? Because it's such a small number. I want to see. So, uh, you're muted, Miss Howie. 
You're I'm muted. Sorry. There's not a majority uh, that moved to take it forward. OK, so the motion fails. OK, and um, uh, Ms. Causey, you said you had another question for Ms. Howie. Yes, so on policy 8364, um, also on page five at the very top, um, it says for statements filed after January 1, 2019, the panel or the office designated by the panel may not provide public access to an individual's home address that the individual has designated as the individual's home address. So I'm curious, The um, it seems like a good um, addition, and I'm curious the rationale um, for it, but also uh, the rationale for the date. So uh, that does have to do with the, the form itself, and the form itself prior to that date, an individual um, could have his or her, um, his or, I'm sorry, I'm looking at two different things. Uh, it has to do with um, the way the form was constructed and the language that we have in uh, Title 19A. Um, the public, the home address of a public employee is not public information. So uh, the, the Comar provision that includes this language is consistent actually with state law and as well the way we have uh, reworked the form. So an individual's home address is not in the new form. Okay, thank you for that explanation. I. It does seem to make sense, um, and I'm just wondering, uh, and I understand about the form um, stating certain things. I'm just wondering if there's any way to make it retroactive um, for, because we have, what, about 300 people in the board and the school system that fill out these forms, and I guess it's a matter of safety, um, potentially. Um, is there any way to retroactively it's something that we would have removed if the individual, uh, if, if there is a request for the individual's home address, it would be, it, ha it would have to have been manually removed by um, the administrative assistant for uh, the panel, depending on when that form is filed. Okay, thank you. Thank you for those questions. Um, oh, it looks like we have board member Ms. Jost who has a question. Ms. Jose? Ms. Jose, oh, if you're there, you're yes. muted. Thank you, sorry. Um, if other committee members have questions, they can go first since I'm not in the committee and I can wait. Did any other committee members have questions? Mr. Mahomza? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Jose. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Ms. Howie, the board has a record retention policy in place right now that also affects financial disclosures. What is the timeline on that? And secondly, in terms of board members' personal home address, how is it um, how is it kept secure? How what is there any guidelines in place to prevent another board member from getting a personal address, especially for security purposes? You know, uh, for safety reasons, or is it public knowledge? Because so, so two questions. Answer, sorry. Sure, sure thing. Let me answer the second question first. Uh, depending on the board member, uh, whether or not the board member is elected, that board member's home address would have to be disclosed somewhere. Uh, because the board member is um, seeking election from a particular uh, congress, I'm sorry, uh, councilmatic district. So that, and I'm just not remembering whether or not for board member financial disclosures, um, there is a way to take out in the current system, there's a way to take that out. Um, I just don't recall. I would have to have to do the research on that. Uh, with respect to your second question as to records retention, uh, what the system has is uh, a records retention schedule and the ethics review panel uh, schedule, uh, which has been approved by the state archivist, does indicate that we keep uh, the, uh, the financial disclosures 
for four years. But obviously, if it's changed in policy, we would then file uh, with the, uh, the state archivist to extend that period. OK, so it is four years and the board's directive for record retention for emails and for uh, financial disclosures is four years as well. And uh, secondly, if an appointed so member was not me, grant, <laughs> go ahead. Sorry. Answer your question as to electronic mail at the current moment, notwithstanding uh, what is in our approved uh, records retention schedules, uh, the, the board currently has a ban in place. So there are no records uh, that are at this point that are being disposed of regardless of what's in the schedule. But I'm not aware of what the, um, the current schedule is or the current requirement is uh, for electronic mail uh, because it would depend on what is in the electronic mail. So, for example, if the electronic mail represents executive correspondence, then it would be subject to executive correspondence. It would be subject to that part of the schedule. It's not necessarily uh, the format in which the, the record comes. It is the content of the record that drives the, uh, the time that it has to be retained. Got you. So it is the content. OK. That's very clear. Thank you. So secondly, if there's an appointed member that did not run for elections, for instance, Mr. Offerman, his personal information should be confidential because he's been appointed. So there is no way for Ms. Scott to know where Mr. Offerman would live unless she asked him or I guess got into the system somehow. So again, my concern is that in terms of security and it's a serious breach of concern for me, which I'm going to bring to the board soon. So, Ms. Um, Ms. Jose, I would have to do the research to see what, um, how the form is constructed for board members and whether or not is it, it is indeed different. Uh, because for employees, you can check off again on the new form uh, when you don't want your home address to show. Uh, but I just do not recall for, uh, for board members. I will have to get back to you. I do not want to misspeak. All right, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for your questions. Um, are there any additional questions or comments from committee members? Yeah, sorry, uh, quick follow up. Yes, Mr. Mahomza. Yeah, uh, Ms. Howie just mentioned about board members um, indicate, I mean not board members, uh, staff members indicating that they don't want their um, address shown. I'm just wondering um, why is that even uh, an option? I, I would assume since they're not public officials that they're and simply employees that their information is already kept confidential. So Mr. Mahomes and not necessarily uh, mm -hmm. again state law the Public Information Act indicates that the home address of a public employee is not public information. So um, and I'm unfortunately dating myself on the forms that uh, we had to fill out in longhand or type in, there was there was uh, a place for you to put your address in. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was, and what I used to do was put my address on a separate sheet of paper and indicate that if a request was made for my financial disclosure statement, that that last sheet of paper was not to be released. Otherwise, someone would have to physically go in and excise my home address from uh, the um, from the form itself. And I again, I just do not recall uh, the way that it's done for board members and I would have to do the research on that, but it's not automatic for employees. And um, actually, never mind. Sorry. Thank you. That, that's all my sure. questions. Mm -hmm. OK. Thank you for that. Um, and I wanted to know uh, to move these policies forward. Um, would we just do I need to process them individually or can they be all processed together? Because it looks like they're all going to uh, first reading. They're all going to first reading. I wasn't aware if there were questions on any other policies. There were obviously questions on 8364, but were there questions on any of the other policies? 
Oh, I thought I had asked that. Yes, did any uh, other members have any questions on any of the other policies presented by Ms. Howie? Okay. Okay, so it looks like you were thorough in answering all of our questions. Um, so would we process them individual or would I process them individually to, for first reading or would they be processed altogether? So just so the record is clear, I would recommend that you process them uh, individually and just take okay. a vote on each one. And take a vote on each one? Okay. Okay, so let me make sure. Okay. All right. Um, so if there are no corrections, then um, uh, I move that policy 8360 is moved forward for first reading. Is there a second? Second, Offerman. Thank you. Could we take a vote, please? Yes, sorry, Ms. Causey. Ms. Causey. Yes, and the 8360 is simply the applicability and the definitions. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Yes, ma'am, that's correct. Thank you, yes. Mr. Offerman. Yes. Mr. Mahunza. Yes. Ms. Scott. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Policy 8360 will be moved forward for the first reading as edited. And next we have, I move that policy 8361 is moved forward for first reading as presented. Is there a second? Second, Offerman. Thank you. If we could do a roll call vote, please, for policy 8361. Yes, Ms. Causey. Abstain. Mr. Offerman. Yes. Ms. Mahomza. Yes. Ms. Scott. Yes. Yes. Three in favor. Thank you. So 83 policy 8361 will move forward for first reading as presented. Um, next, I move that policy 8362 gifts move forward um, as presented. Is there a second? Second Offerman. Thank you. If we could do a roll call vote, please. Yes, Ms. Causey. Abstain. Mr. Offerman. Yes. Ms. Mahumza. Yes. Ms. Scott. Yes. Three in favor. Thank you. So policy 8362 is moved forward for first reading as presented. Next, I move that policy 8363, conflict of interest, prohibited conduct, um, move forward. Is there a second? Offerman, yes. Second. Thank you. Thanks. If we could do a vote, please. Roll call yes. vote. Ms. Causey. Abstain. Mr. Offerman. Yes. Ms. Mahomza. Yes. Ms. Scott. Yes. Three in favor. Thank you. Policy 8363 moves forward to first reading. Okay. And next, let's see, is um, I move that policy 8364, financial disclosure statements, moves forward. Is there a second? Second, Offerman. Thank you. Can you do a roll call vote, please? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Causey? No. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahumza? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Three in favor. Thank you. Policy 8364 is moved forward for first reading as presented. And I move that policy 8365 lobbying and the lobbying registration and lobbying reported form uh, move forward as well. Is there a second? Second, Offerman. Okay, if we could take a roll call vote, please. Yes, Ms. Causey. Abstain. Mr. Offerman. Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Three in favor. Thank you. And now we are on 
policy, I believe it's 8366. We just processed, um, just to, so I can make sure, because it's a lot of policies here. We just po processed policy 8365. That is correct. Correct. Okay. So now we are on. Um, so I move policy 8366, ethics review panel, move forward. Is there a second? Second, Offerman. Thank you. If we may take a vote, roll call vote, please. Yes, Ms. Causey? No. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Mahumza? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Three in favor. Thank you. So policy 8366 will be will move forward for first reading as edited. Thank you. So next we have um, policy 8601, our social media policy presenting will be Ms. Howie. And as background, a letter dated January 28th, 2021 from the Office of the Inspector General for Education advised me as board chair of numerous complaints received by um, that office concerning some of our board members decorum while conducting meetings and when communicating through the use of social media associated with the school system. As a result of that letter, I have asked staff to develop a social media policy to govern board members use of online platforms, platforms and personal social media accounts and to provide consequences for inappropriate use of social media platforms. Um, I'd like to know, is there any discussion on, well, actually, um, I guess we'll hear from Ms. Howie. Um, is there a presentation, Ms. Howie? Yes, just very briefly, um, Madam Chair, uh, as you indicated, this was precipitated by uh, correspondence received from the Office of the Inspector General. Uh, there are no Maryland Board of Education policies addressing board member behavior. Uh, I would also uh, point out that the Inspector General asked that there be uh, some sort of policy that applies to employees. That will be coming to you at your next um, policy review committee meeting. Frederick County Schools does have a policy that addresses employee social media behavior, uh, but as I indicated, there are no policies on the books in Maryland that address uh, behavior of school board members. Uh, there were um, suggested policies um, that guided uh, staff's work from Louisiana, New Jersey, and then NSBA um, as well had um, suggestions uh, including the Texas Association of School Boards. So those are sort of wrapped up in, in what you have before you as new policy 8601. Uh, first, the policy statement about what you as a board believe. Um, and again, it's about social networks. Clearly social networks are um, important means of communication with your public. Uh, they look to uh, board members uh, for information and for engagement, and that's how board members have been using social media, regardless of whether or not you're on this board or other boards. Uh, so um, additionally, there are standards. Again, your uh, policy uh, format is to have a policy statement and then standards. So the standards that are included here were those that were um, were cobbled from those uh, boards of education that do have policies uh, applicable to uh, board members as opposed to employees. And then finally, it was asked that staff include violations. That is in subsection three. Uh, and your regular language for implementation is in subsection four. Thank you for that. Um, and. So we'll, we can start again with discussions or questions and um, on any of the uh, policy that was presented, our social media policy, which again, Ms. Howie said it is new. So I'll go around and I'll start again with Ms. Calzi. Any questions? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my first question is, has uh, board council reviewed this draft policy? No, ma'am. Board Council has not reviewed it. Would you like it sent to uh, Carney Callahan? Well, I believe that would be up to the chair or if 
the committee as a whole requested that. Mm -hmm. So if yeah, Madam fine. Chair would want to do it um, with her authority, that would be fine. Or if uh, the committee, yeah. if she'd like the committee to vote on it, that we can process it as she decides. I am fine with it. Um, with Miss Howie uh, sending it to um, Carnegie Callahan. Thank you. And my other question is, um, I was, uh, I have a, not a binder, but a, a good inch and a half thick policy review committee uh, document from February 11, 2019, where I believe it was um, you and your staff that put together uh, a really comprehensive um, review of Maryland LEAs and then also other states uh, with social media um policies and then also included from the national school board association um training that they have um, on communications um for school board members so i just was going to ask and <clears throat> was was that um developed at the request of um the policy review committee after december 2018 if you recall. I don't understand the question. So. Do you I just am and number one, it was a, a very handy resource, so I wanted to thank whoever put it together, um, but it's dated policy review committee February 11, 2019, and I just didn't recall whether it was. Um, something that was already in 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 line to be reviewed. Um, prior to December 2018, which is when this uh, group of board members uh, was sworn in together, or whether it was prior. But if you don't recall either, that's fine. Um, but I did just want to thank whoever put that together. It would have been Ms. Clark and Ms. Crafton. Okay, well, thank you to them then. Mm -hmm. um, is that it? That's it for now. Yes, thank you. OK, thanks. And I will go around. Um, next, we have Mr. Mahomza. Yes, um, on page one, line 36 through um, 39, uh, which reads, a board member shall not post statements that appear that statements that make it appear that you or she has already formed an opinion on matters pending board approval. Um, I guess I, I wanted some clarity. Is this just talking about like an item that is on, a, on the agenda that board members are going to discuss, or is it even like, or is it like a platform or opinions like, let's say a, uh, a candidate runs on? Um, so I would not see these as statements um, revolving around or for an election. I would see it as statements that make it look as if a board member has decided uh, how he or she is going to vote prior to uh, the board member being within the public body and deliberating with, um, with other board members. So it's one thing to have a political opinion which uh, should not be in any way uh, exercised, but it's enough, or it should be exercised, not exorcised. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite another thing to basically deliberate your uh, decisions in a space that is not uh, the board meeting or not with other board members. The public is allowed to see, that's what the Open Meetings Act is about. The public meeting, the public is allowed to see how the board deliberates in order to reach a decision. Mm -hmm. So putting that in another space that while may be while that, that may be a public space because it's a public facing uh, social media account is is not uh, the purpose of the deliberative process. OK, uh, and I've seen um, I believe another I think, I think this was another board member that um, they published a motion that they wanted um, to make during the board meeting. Uh, is that affected under that language right here? Because um, if you're making a motion, basically you, that's an opinion and you're 
most likely going to vote on your own motion. So if like a person posts motions that they want to um, make during the meeting and make that public on their social media platforms, um, would that violate the language right now? I don't necessarily see that as deliberation. Um, if they if they are stating what they're doing and not necessarily a belief in a particular position before having heard what the other um, what the other points of view are. OK, so uh, you're basically saying. Uh, let's say if I uh, there's something with like transportation and I go on my social media and say. Uh, I don't believe our buses are effective. I'm going to vote to not continue any contracts right now with that pertains to busing. Is that what you're talking about? Not so that that to me sounds as if you formed an opinion without having heard what all the points of view are. Okay. So There's let's say if I a platform, let's say. So let's say I I, I write a motion that says um, I'm I'm going to move that we don't continue any more busing contracts, and this is why. And at the times you might add like a caption underneath that of why you're going to make that motion. And is that would that violate the current language? So you're stating a platform as opposed to stating um, that what seems to be part of the deliberative process. It's a fine line. Sorry, uh, and I would be concerned. OK, thank you. And, and I'm sorry for like, uh, uh, I guess creating hypotheticals that obviously might not happen, but I just wanted uh, some clarity on the language. Well, and again, if the this is the board's policy, and the the reason that it's being brought forward is to clarify what the board, what your expectations are of your fellow board members. If it doesn't clarify what the expectations are then there's no pride of authorship take it out or clarify what you expect when board members communicate via social media thank you for that yeah no thank you for that josh hypotheticals are good because it's an example um, of uh, what we're looking at so um uh, mr offerman did you have any questions uh actually a comment and i would ask the uh all the people on this call that they could they could help us with this since we're referring this to Carney Callahan does it make sense to move this forward now or wait until we get a response from Carney Callahan assuming that they can give it to us by the next time we meet that's an open question to anybody sure so you can you can there are several options you have uh, one option is uh, to move it forward to the board without recommendation one option is to, and uh, as former members, as those members, all of you have been on the committee before, know that it can come back to the committee as unfinished business uh, Another uh, at another meeting. Another option is to send it to Carney. If Carney does not have substantive recommendations, then it can be moved forward to the board. So you have any of those um, options available to you. My question would be, I think the, 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 um, the question to the committee would be, what's your goal? If your goal is to have it reviewed uh, so that if there are amendments that your council has, uh, then send it to your council to be reviewed and bring it back next month. If your goal is to move it forward, then send it to council and have council bring it back to you within a certain amount of time. Uh, the concern I would have with it going forward without seeing amendments is that the committee has not had a chance to review any suggested amendments if there are suggested amendments. And uh, excuse me, Ms. Howie, when you're saying suggested amendments, you mean that would come from council? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Sorry, uh, uh, Mr. Offerman, um, I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, that's, that's fine, thank you. I would, I would, uh, I would suggest that we go ahead and uh, and uh, and uh, move it forward, uh, n knowing that uh, we're going to get some input from uh, from uh, uh, Carney Callahan. Thank you. Okay. 
OK, uh, it looks like um, Miss Causey, you have an additional question. Yes, thank you. I appreciate um, Mr. Mahomes's questions and along those lines in reviewing it. Um, I have a couple questions that I'll just quickly ask them one at a time um, if that's OK. Um, the first one is typically when we have uh, the policy, it will then at the very end, as it does, it says related policies and it lists those and then um, any related law. So is there any related law that was considered um, any legal reference, for instance, that was considered or that um, might be considered? There are legal references that might be considered about um, board member removal, uh, but no, those were not uh, those were not included. That that would be Comar 13A0102, I believe, uh, which addresses the removal of members of a local board of education. And that can certainly be um, included in the legal references if the committee so desires. Thank you. One of the things um, that I was thinking about is uh, with social media where there's comments that are available, there has been uh, legal cases where elected officials have um, removed certain comments or blocked certain users and there there are legal precedents and I don't know them but I, um, but I would ask if you do if you could share those with us um, related to social media mm -hmm. because this is a changing environment so the legal precedents may be helpful as a guide so uh, let me make sure I understand the, the question and the request um, I believe there's only one policy on the books where we reference um, a case uh, and Ms. Ms. Clark can correct me if I'm wrong and I think that policy is no longer on the books. So is it the committee's desire that the legal references include case law or simply uh, regulations and statutes? Um, this is Ms. Scott. I don't see the um, purpose of that. Um, I, I, I don't see the purpose in, in referencing case laws. I think that um, what's there, and I think what you said, the regulations and statutes would, would be appropriate, um, but I'm happy to hear from others. So, okay, any additional questions? I have a question. Um, I know that it will be, um, if moved, um, that it would go to first reading. Would it be presented at our March 9th meeting? I don't believe so. Um, I think that the schedule, it would be, first reading would be March 23rd was uh, based, that's what we thought based on your approval this evening. March 23rd, okay. Okay, um, Ms. Calsey, you have another an additional question? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. So on page two, paragraph E, it says board members should always conduct themselves online in a manner that reflects well of the board and the school system and shall avoid posting information that has not been verified and made public by the board. Mm -hmm. um, we receive as board members, and I think the whole school system, uh, what's called the communication daily briefing, where there's a number of news articles about education. Some are specific to Baltimore County, some are uh, specific to Maryland, and others are, are national. Mm -hmm. um, and I also know that, um, and I know that sometimes those have been posted. Um, and I also know that uh, there's information from the state board, there's information from county council, uh, there's information from a variety of sources, uh, you know, maybe the um, National Gifted and Talented uh, Association uh, in terms of articles relating to education. So I think that that um, language is too restrictive. Do you have a recommended edit, ma'am? Um, I don't, and I would 
Um, and I, I, I don't think that it's in a position to move forward. I'd like to see what board council has to say. Um, and I'd also like to see legal references. Um, and then that would give the committee um, clear information as to whether those legal references would help guide additional additional paragraphs um, or maybe um, guide us to modify some of this content. So the procedures to uh, remove a local board member are found in Comar 13A 0105 sub 12. And the uh, procedures do indicate that grounds for removal uh, may include misconduct in office, incompetency, immorality, willful neglect of duty, or failure to attend a required, numbers of a required number of scheduled school board meetings. Uh, the immorality, incompetency, willful neglect of duty, misconduct in office obviously would apply uh, to um, abuse of social media. I don't see how failure to attend a required number of scheduled board meetings would, but certainly if um, that standard is something that uh, the committee desires to see, and I will make sure that board council um, knows that in addition to uh, 13A 105 uh, that the um, that the committee would like to see other legal references if they are extant. Okay, thank you. It looks like we have a question from Ms. Pastor. Thank you, Ms. Scott. I'm wondering, just uh, based on the reference that you used as you opened this discussion, maybe to uh, Ms. Howie, with other work that the board and committee um, is doing to sort of rein in where we are uh, for now and for the future in terms of uh, social media usage. What would you see, Ms. Howie, as our protocol for moving forward in that regard? Do we wait until we hear back in terms of the policy? May we continue forward um, in, in terms of working to some social media and um, as a committee? Uh, while we're waiting for the policy, what what should our process be at this point? I'm sorry, your process for what, ma'am? We if we are working as on the board, because mm -hmm. a piece of this has to do with uh, what we put out handbook or what we use as our norms. How mm -hmm. do we move forward as we're waiting for word about the policy? So I don't necessarily see the two as mutually exclusive. Uh, my position has always been that the handbook is like policy, even though it's called a handbook, the board votes on it, the board passes it, and it governs the activity and actions of the board. That sounds like a board policy to me. Uh, so I don't think that it has less authority or gravitas uh, than a board policy because I think they function in this ultimately in the same way. It's an official act of the board to adopt uh, a set of standards and a way to operate. That also sounds like your 8000 series. Mm -hmm. It's simply uh, given a different title. Thank you. I just wanted to make that clear so that there's no um, controversy over that down the road. So we will proceed forward doing as we're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pastor, Mrs. Pastor, for that. And um, I do know that we are coming up on our time. Um, so I just wanted to see if there aren't any corrections, um, then we should move forward. Ms. Kelsey, you had another statement? Because um, we are coming up on our time. So yes, please go ahead. Yes, um, thank you, Ms. Pastor, for your questions and Ms. Howie for your answers. I would like to see included language that says that board members are not required to uh, engage in social media, um, that it is an optional activity. I would also like to see um, some different language <clears throat> um, about the um, page one, paragraph 2B, about board members will not deliberate board business on any online platform. Um, 
because I'm not, after listening to Mr. Mahomes' questions, I'm not sure that board members stating an opinion at a point in time is um, stating a vote that's coming. Um, also, I would say, you know, what if someone talks about a vote that they took in the past, an action that was already taken in the past, then could that be misconstrued as uh, deliberating future board business based on on past? I just think that there's um, a lot of ambiguity there. Um, and I also would like to see clarification with the law, Ms. Howie, where it states the board takes action as a majority, that as individuals, board members don't take action. So um, I'm, I'm so, not I'm sure sorry. how they could actually deliberate Ms. by Halsey, themselves if there were a, multiple making... board members engaged in a conversation on social media, then maybe that would be considered deliberation. I guess I would just like to um, see yeah, more I'm just going to ask clarification, uh, just so that I'm clear. Are you making a motion, Ms. Causey, or are you just uh, uh, offering suggestions to 8601? Um, I'm not making any motions at this point. I I think that um, this needs more work. So. <clears throat> OK, because I feel that it's sound and that it speaks to the issues that we've been having um, with social media usage. And as I said, with some of the um, uh, issues that have been going on, and I, I feel like we need something um, that's clear and sound. So, I mean, I feel that it's ready to move to the full board. So, um, that's why I was asking if there was any corrections or any additions or anything um, that that needed to be made. But I feel that it's it's pretty sound the way that it is written and that it's ready to move to the full board. So, I'm, I'm open to any questions or suggestions about that, but I think that we need to move on. Um, Ms. Calls, you have a question for me directly? Yes. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. So you had referenced uh, the impetus for this policy, um, a letter from the OIGE inspector. Um, and I guess even with that, were there specific examples that would be helpful um, for the board members to evaluate because I'm I wasn't clear what the issues were and that may be something that's for an administrative function or a closed function uh, to ask legal advice because it mm -hmm. came from the inspector general but I I wasn't clear what the issues were so I don't so I'm not clear that this is the solution yes so um I the letter um that I referenced um uh well I uh, read the same letter. I felt that it was very clear, and that's something that we can discuss or go more into in admin function. But um, this is not uh, a reinventing of the wheel. He um, felt that I, as the chair, needed to take action. So it is appropriate to have a policy that addresses it. It is appropriate to have um, items in our handbook that address it. I would, you know, advise you to reference um, the letter, but also this is. A way that we can develop a social media policy so that we can have something a guiding um, force going forward so that we can govern our actions and um, know how to operate appropriately it's not exclusive to our school system there are other school systems and boards that have this so um, this is our working it out and i think that it would be appropriate um, and I feel that it is also necessary, but I feel it is appropriate at this time to move it forward um, to the full board. So um, does anyone else have any questions? Are there any corrections or anything else? OK, so if there are no corrections, then policy 8601 is moved forward for first reading as presented. And Ms. Howie, you said that would be March 23rd. For first yes, reading. Yes. OK, but so uh, considering uh, that Carnegie Callahan is going to look at it, um, that seems like that's more than enough time for them to receive it, review it um, and look at it. So, OK, um, our next item is policy 8221 board officers, chair and vice chair duties and policy 8221 has been added to the agenda at um, my request. 
Um, so if everyone's had a chance to read it, I, I'm open for any discussion or any questions. Um, Ms. Howie, was there anything you wanted to say about this? I, I, I felt it was very straightforward. No, ma'am. Okay. Okay, I'll go around um, and see if there's any questions on 8221. Um, Ms. Causey? Ms. Causey? Thank you, Madam Chair. I had put into the chat that I object to moving forward the draft oh, I policy see that now. 8601 okay. for social media. So I requested, should we take a vote? Okay, I move that policy um, 8601 is moved forward for first reading. Um, is there a second? Second, Hoffman. Thank you. May we take a vote, please? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Causey? No. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahunza? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Three in favor. Thank you. So policy 8601 is moved forward for first reading as presented. Um, so now again, I read uh, policy 8221, which we all have. It was added at my request. Um, are there any questions or any discussion for uh, policy on policy 8221? Ms. Causey? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, so I guess my questions are in um, around the issue of who determines or how is it determined that a board member has violated the standard um, set forth in subparagraph 2A6? Okay, so your question is who determines that a board member has violated it? Yes. So I guess if a board member read the policy and sees it and they violate it, then um, it's um, a violation, but also it's the board that would decide. And where are you at? You said 2A6? Yes, serves as the official spokesperson of the board. Yes. So there are a number of there are a number of situations where board members, individual board members, speak. Um, they speak to their community associations. They speak to um, the legislature. They speak to uh, constituents on the side of a soccer field, or uh, they speak to the media. Um, they speak in board meetings. Um, so when so where is the guideline of what distinguishes that a violation has occurred? Um, so um, you're right, board members, and that's what it means to be a board member, like you said, speak at um, various events, community associations, one on one with um, um, uh, various um, individuals. The um, violation is if a member of the board is speaking as the board chair or speaking on behalf of the board. They can speak as an individual. They can speak as an individual board member. Some of us are parents. You can speak as a, as, as a parent. But if you're speaking on behalf of the board and speaking as though you have the consent of the board or you're speaking on behalf of the chair, then that's very easily and very clearly a violation. So I think that's I feel like that is spelled out and clear there. Is there language that you would suggest to be added? Um, I don't have language at this time, but I, I don't think it's clear, especially related to the media or for, um, and again, relating back to social media, um, but also in other people, you know, repeating what you said. But uh, for instance, when I have spoken not on behalf of the board and I have made a very specific statement that I'm making comments as an individual board member with my own opinion that I'm not speaking on behalf of the board. But if the media chooses to not continue to put that statement in, even though that was part of my original statement, then is that is that construed as a violation because the media decided to make a clip? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Well, so I think there's a lot of gray area. Well, what I think is, is for something like that is letting the chair know that you're doing an interview. So it's very clear beforehand that you're doing an interview and that you're speaking as an individual and not 
in the name of the board or in the name of the chair. Um, so I think it, it's the it's the onus is on the um, individual board member to communicate with the chair in regards to speaking engagements, communicate with um, our executive assistant Tracy um, to um, not have those sorts of um, miscommunications happen or misunderstandings happen. But um, like I said, if there's suggested language, please suggest it. Um, but I feel that it is very direct and succinct. So um, well, I want to make sure others, I, I don't know we're coming up. I'm sorry. Thank you for that um, explanation because um, I think that is helpful because um, in our board handbook, I believe is where the statement is about um, board members will alert the board chair, but I don't see that in the policy. So maybe that's um, an addition that should be put in the policy so that um, would be more clear. I want to make sure we get everybody on because we are coming up on time. Mr. Mahomsa, do you have a question or comment? No comment. Okay, Mr. Offerman? None. Okay. All right, so um, I don't have any additional comments and I think it should come to the full board. Um, so if there's no additions or corrections or um, motions or any language um, being added, then I would um, uh, state that um oh miss Calzy, are you <laughs> looks like you're typing something in. you have another question okay yes and i see where this policy speaks to um board member violations related to speaking on behalf of the board um but this language is not in any other board policy relating to any other type of misconduct so is this language going to be considered to be included because there is other misconduct um, and we have received a number of emails about conduct um, in board meetings. Um, okay. So I'm just curious, is this, is this something that uh, is going to be added to other policies related to board conduct? Not at this time. I, um, I felt that it was uh, important for um, it to be added to this and others. And um, I think that it's it's self-explanatory. So I know that we are buttressing up on our time. It's actually 6:30. So um, I make a motion. I move that policy 8221 is moved forward for first reading as presented. Is there a second? Second, Offerman. Thank you. May we take a vote, please? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Causey. No. Mr. Offerman. Yes. Ms. Mahumza. Yes. Ms. Scott. Yes. Three. Thank you. Thank you. So policy 8221 will be moved forward for first reading as edited. So um, the is Ms. Um, uh, Ms. Scott, I did want to bring to your attention based on Ms. Causey's comment that the uh, the violation section that is in 8221 is the same that is in policy 8601. And that's a social media policy. Yes, ma'am. OK. Thank you for that. All right, so now the floor is now open to members of the committee to discuss issues of concern, but um, I really have to emphasize that this is not the time to conduct business as there has not been notice provided as required by the Open Meetings Act. So are there any issues of concern? I'll just go around and call everybody's name. Ms. Causey? Ms. Causey? Thank you. In order to not um, deliberate on what would be considered board business, I will make no comments at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Mr. Mahomza? No comments. Mr. Offerman? Thank no. you, Mr. Mr. Mahomza. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mahomza. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Thank you to all the committee members. All right. Um, so the next meeting of the Policy and Review Committee is scheduled for March 15th, 2021 at 4.30 p.m. Because there is no further business, the meeting is now adjourned, and I thank you all for your time. Have a good evening. Thank you, committee members. Goodbye.